Hello, this is Kerry Schutz with MathWorks. In this video, I'm going to show how to measure transfer functions in Simulink. In our example here, we have a Harris elliptic bandpass filter, and that's our device under test, the block for which we want to measure the magnitude and phase response of. You can see it's built in block diagram form, and it consists of a series of stages. So if we just look under the hood of stage one, we see, you know, delay lines, adders, multipliers, um, summers. Um, and then the similar story, if you look under the second stage, it's really uh, just different coefficients, um, but same architecture. And, you know, it's a similar story on the bottom path, and those two paths are summed. And then you can optionally, um, you know, choose the top path only uh, with the top switch position, or you can sum the paths and scale them. So in this video, we're not getting to how that filter was designed. We are assuming we have this design and we either don't know its response. So we want to measure its response, its frequency response, or we know what it should be and we want to confirm it or verify that we're achieving uh, the design goals that, that which we designed this filter for in practice. So just because you design something to have a certain response doesn't mean it will, so you always have to test it and, and uh, measure and confirm uh, the frequency response. All right, and then in parallel with our device under test, we have essentially the equivalent of the elliptic bandpass filter, except it's described in just state space matrix form. So this is the LTI block in Simulink, and we've just used a state space object to describe it. So if I just copy that, we can see what it is. I'll go over here and just paste that name. And we can kind of see, you know, it's a bunch of ABCD matrices. Um, and you can see the order here, the A matrix. It's a pretty large state space uh, matrix. It's 24 by 24. So it's 24th order filter. Okay, so that that then these two should be, you know, very, very similar. Um, I used a technique called linear um, uh, or a linear analysis technique. Uh, to derive the state space uh, block or description from the block diagram description of the filter. So I use a tool that's part of simulate control design. Again, we're not showing that, I'm just mentioning how I arrived at this separate implementation. Okay, and then really the subject matter or the focus of the day is how we measure the transfer function uh, of these blocks. And we're gonna, what we're gonna do in this case is we're going to measure the transfer function. Uh, we're, we're gonna measure two transfer functions simultaneously or in parallel, and then display their responses, the magnitude and phase uh, overlaid with each other on the same um, axes. So we'll see one magnitude response plot uh, two, two waveforms overlaid and a phase response plot with, again, two responses overlaid. I'm going to go ahead and run this model and then we'll get into more how this transfer function technique actually works. And we're running and then we pretty much instantly see the response. And I should emphasize here also that this is a discrete time implementation. I did show you the Z to the minus one blocks earlier. That's kind of a clue that it is discrete time. Uh, but you know, I just want to confirm that with you. And so in this case, we're measuring the response from zero to 500 kilohertz. So in our case, the sample rate is an even one megahertz. And we can see it's a bandpass filter with the center frequency uh, centered right around 250 kilohertz. Okay, and of course you can see it's phase response here as well. So it, it runs pretty fast. Uh, now really the question is, how does this work? What do, what do we do under the hood of this block to do the measurement? Well, you can see typically when you measure a transfer function, there's at least, you know, you need two sorts of signals. You need the excitation and then you need the response. And in this case, we're taking the two responses, we're concatenate, concatenating them into a single uh, signal, you know, just two dimensional, and that forms our response channel. So let's go under the hood of the transfer function block. All right, so you'll see under the hood, we've got our excitation. It is a random signal. We're using a random source block and that drives out on the excitation port EXC. Then we actually concatenate that as well uh, into a two-dimensional signal since we're going to be taking a two, we're going to be performing this computation, uh, computation two-dimensionally. 
And we use the uh, discrete transfer function estimator block uh, to compute the transfer function to get in this case, since it's going to be it's a two channel measurement, or I should say it's two two channel measurements, uh, because each transfer function block is essentially a, a two channel measurement by itself. Okay, so we've got our excitation channel, which we're calling X here, we've got our response coming out of the blocks. Uh, which again, we, we've concatenated them. So we got a one by two signal. That's our response. And then the discrete transfer function estimator block comes from the DSP system toolbox. And we're using it to compute the transfer function. So we can dive underneath here. We hit this arrow in the lower left-hand corner. We can see what it does. And what it does is first is it buffers up the signal because when you measure a transfer function, it's by definition a buffered measurement. We're taking FFTs. Then we're using uh, you know a lower level block under the hood called discrete transfer function estimator, and we can actually dive underneath this, this block. This is a, a block that MathWorks provides. It's already written for you. Um, you can see how it works, and of course there's a number of parameters on the outside which I didn't show you yet. In fact, we should probably pop the stack before we do that. Uh, the transfer function estimator block has a number of parameters on it. You can specify uh, things like the window length, which is usually uh, and FFT length, usually those two things are synchronized, although not always. Um, you've got your averaging method running, uh, averaging or exponential averaging, it's like additive averaging or exponential averaging, how many averages you want to perform, um, and then whether you want the uh, display to be in one-sided or in two-sided. And that's pretty much it. Okay, we're just going to leave it at that. Uh, for now, uh, let's see. Oh, I, I didn't. I don't know if I mentioned the window function. It's going to be hand in this case. You can change that. And then, if you again, if we dive down into that block, we saw the buffering operations. Because again, we're going to be taking FFTs. We're not going to take FFTs on scalar values. We're going to be taking them off vector values. We go underneath this block, and it's all grayed out because we're really usually not using this block directly. This is just really a building block of the larger transfer function estimator block. We can see how it's built though. We can see how it was constructed by the source code button. And I can pull that up here on my main screen and you see it is um, you know, written in object oriented form. It's a system object. It's uh, deriving from the DSP.transfer function estimator class. And then if we, and then it's got you know, different properties, but the real, it's got a, a setup a phase, you know, method, uh, or function. It's also got the step implementation, which is really the one. If you really usually you want to look at the implementation, there's really only two main uh, methods or functions you're interested in, and that's the uh, the step, the setup, and and definitely the step implementation. So, if we look underneath there, the main function that's being called is DSP .transfer function estimator. Uh, I can highlight that and just say open it. When I do that, you know, it's saying, again, it's saying it's deriving from matlab.system. We don't need to follow all the derivations, but we do, we, it's a similar story as before. We would like to understand how it works, um, how it computes the transfer function. We'll go to the step implementation again. And again, we're passing in X and Y, the input and the output. And what it does is it, um, it computes, um, a auto spectrum that's pxx of the input it computes a cross spectrum between the output and the input that's pyx it takes the ratio and that is the transfer function estimate so it's the ratio of the cross spectrum over the auto spectrum of the input and that's it we pretty much return h uh, we're not looking at coherence right now so i'm going to skip that we're focusing on the transfer function estimate H. That's what gets returned. Uh, that's the output of the transfer function estimator block. If we pop the stack, I take that and we separate it into its magnitude and its phase via the complex to magnitude angle block. I scale it for dB uh, and for go, go from radians to degrees. And then I display that on our spectrum analyzer. Now it is important to note that the spectrum analyzer now is no longer computing uh, FFTs or windowing or averaging. It is merely being used as the display block here. So if we double click on this block, um, you know, there's a setting under here where basically it says, hey, 
um, don't compute uh, the spectrum, just, just use the data that's already been pre-computed and display it. And that setting is actually right here under estimation. If you go under estimation, the default mode for the spectrum analyzer is in time, meaning the input signal is coming in the time domain, and then we're going to get compute FFTs, windowsing, and averaging. Uh, in this case, our setting is on frequency, meaning everything has already been done for us. All you're going to be doing is using the spectrum analyzer as a display tool, which is what we're doing here. Okay, so we did the same setting again on the phase response block here. Now, when I ran this before, it may have looked like we were just displaying one transfer function, but in fact, because the state space description is so close to the original uh, filtered description, uh, you could only really see one uh, magnitude and phase response. So what I'm going to do is show you how we can modify that. I'm going to go under the hood of the um, of the Harris bandpass filter. I'm going to go under the first stage. I'm going to take the D4 coefficient, and I'm just going to modify it in the thousandths place or by a very, very small fraction of a percent. And when I do that, again, you're going to see uh, the response creep up just a little bit. Okay, so you can definitely tell there's a difference uh, when I modify that coefficient, that just that one coefficient out of the mini. Okay, I'll go back to making it the original one. We'll see the response come back. One thing I should mention before I close here today on this subject of measuring transfer functions for discrete time systems is what I did versus what's available in the shipping product. So as you see, there we have a, a mass subsystem here for measuring the transfer function that I created. In this block, you can specify the FFT size, the sample rate, and the number of spectral averages you want to perform. Now, of course, that was my decision. I could have also exposed more uh, transfer function measurement parameters as well. For example, uh, I could have specified the type of windowing I wanted to perform, but I didn't do that here. That's completely optional. Uh, so what I did was the the block the core block that's used is what I mentioned earlier is discrete transfer function estimator. You can always just go into um, simulate at any point, start left click typing and say discrete transfer function estimator, and that's the block I used. You can also find this block by just navigating uh, in in simulate. You just bring up your library browser. I don't think I have it open right now. I'll just open it up, and if you go to just DSP system toolbox. I think it's under estimation. Let's go to power spectrum estimation. And if you go down there, you should find the discrete transfer function estimator. So that's the block I used. There's also, for just single channel measurements, there's also a spectrum estimator as well. All right, so that was that's the core. However, to really package this up and make it useful uh, out of the box, I also added on the excitation. Uh, in this case, I added you know, excitation such that you could do a two channel or two transfer function measurement. If you just had a single transfer function measurement, you wouldn't need the matrix concat block, concatenate block here. You could just drive the source directly into uh, the input X and then export it out to the excitation port. And then I've got a re the response from the device under test here. Uh, I've got the transfer function estimator block. And then I've got, you know, the other basically border plate. You need to make a transfer function measurement, magnitude and phase proper scaling, whatever you want, and then your um, a spectrum analyzer block. So you can put that all underneath a mass subsystem. And really, it's voila, you have a block, which you can just drag and drop in your system. Anytime you want to make a transfer function measurement, you just put this uh, block in your system. And you connect wired up and start measuring transfer functions. All right, that's all I have on discrete transfer function measurements. In a follow-up video, I'm going to make a video on how to measure transfer functions of continuous time systems or of analog circuits. So stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, I should mention also, finally, one more note. Um, I'm going to place uh, this example on GitHub. I've uh, pr produced a link here below. Uh, and I'm going to put that link in the description as well so that you can um, access this example without trying to duplicate everything on your own. So uh, 